have to take my Hello, everyone. Off. Can you hear me? Good. <laughs> uh, my name is Jasper. Um, and I just want to thank, first of all, I want to thank Rory and Jarena and Rebecca for, for inviting us down to LitFest. Really happy to be here. Um, definitely looking forward to having lots of fun over the weekend, which shouldn't be hard if uh, last night is anything to go by. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Dillis Project, a very basic introduction for everyone who has no idea what it is. It, uh, it basically is a project that came from a shared dream between Katie and I to, to spend a summer in Connemara. And I would say that with uh, next to no money, um, a very little shed and lots of people, we, we set about doing that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so what we did was we went down and, and like on a, an extremely limited budget, we, we, we tried to turn a very old, like damp, drafty uh, boat shed, which is just down by the sea from my parents' house um, in Cleggan, in Connemara. We, we tried to turn it into a, a dining hall with one big long communal table, so, so everyone sat together. And then we, uh, we, we knocked a hole in the wall through to the adjoining shed where we built a very, very simple kitchen uh, but the shed had previously been housing a couple of donkeys, so they, were, they weren't too happy about the fact that we had to kick them out. But obviously when the HSE came along and they found out that we were setting up shop at an animal house, they were ecstatic, you know, as you can imagine. They were very happy about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we, we, it was basically two months of putting the whole thing together. Um, there, was, there was no electricity in the shed, there was no water in the shed, we had to have it, you know, cables ran in and pipes ran in to plumb it all. There was, there was no toilet down there even, so a really good friend of ours, Sam Gleason, who you'll see, uh, you'll see him running around here this weekend, he, he built for us what I'm sure anyone who had the pleasure of using it would describe uh, as like maybe the most spectacular compost glue you're ever likely to see. A beautiful, beautiful timber, timber structure. Um, just at the gable end of one of the sheds, kind of positioned such that, such that when you were in position, you would see a perfectly framed uh, view of Inish Boffin in a perfectly placed window. Um, so it was a really, really spectacular thing, you know, so much so that obviously, oh yeah, by the way, loads of Chantanou's lovely pictures are running by here. So these are just pictures from the project. Um, you know, the, the toilet was such a success that even though Katie and I and everyone, we were there trying to put everything we could into the food and give everyone such a great experience that very often the kind of complimentary banter you might hear over the course of the dinner or lots of the entries in the, in the guest book were, were about the, the loo. So, you know, <laughs> so I think he did a really good job. Um, but Sam, along with loads and loads of other people, uh, came out in force to help us set the whole thing up. Uh, you know, like, we had local help from our neighbours, like Josie, who helped us so much with the garden. Um, Josie, incidentally, whose who's late husband was born in the shed where we were having the dinner, so it did have a nice little kind of connection to the area and to lots of the people there. Um, uh, Rosie from We Are Islanders, she came out, uh, she just heard of the project, we didn't know her at all, and she heard of the project and she offered to make us these beautiful, beautiful napkins, uh, which you'll also see a picture of at some stage. Um, but, you know, by way of trying to explain the amount of, uh, just the amount of generosity uh, that was extended to us as we were trying to put the project together. And I really feel that, that stemmed from, uh, you know, a, a belief of ours that we, really, that we really wanted to do the project, we really cared about the project. Um, and so on a very, like, on a shoestring, uh, a shoestring budget, people seem to really respond to the, to the, the, the genuine nature of it. And that was something that was very touching for us and inspiring for us, you know. So it, just to see that people can take a simple idea, the fact that they want to do it, that they're willing to work hard for it, generates an amazing response, you know, from so many other people. So that was a very, very touching kind of part of the project for me, I would say. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it was, it was two months of, uh, of working uh, day and night, uh, which was very, very enjoyable. We had help coming from from all over the place. And uh, yeah, we, we eventually, we got it off the ground. So we were very happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, so the, the aims of our project from the real, can everyone hear me? Yeah. The aims of the project from the real start was we wanted to be unwasteful, sustainable, and as local as possible. Um, we, 
we picked up our fish um, locally, like 20 minutes away from Cleggan Har Harbour. It was all line caught. Um, it meant that we only got pollock most of the time, sometimes a little bit of mackerel. But we decided that we didn't want to get fish from you know, really far away when we could get this from really close by. Um, we picked seaweed nearly every day. It was, I think, a little trickery on our behalf when we were trying to come up with a name for the project um, that we were kind of going through seaweeds and, and settled on Dillisk. And we thought, if we call it Dillisk, then we have to find out about the seaweeds and we have to explore them. Um, we used to get big buckets of water and bring them out to sea and reduce the salt water down to make our own salt. Um, we did stuff like we made a tandoor because Jas had always had this dream to have a to have a tandoor, and so with the help of friends, we made that and we cooked all of the pollock that we were just talking about in there. Um, it was kind of this project where we basically just did what we wanted to, um, and we kind of didn't let any confines or restrictions kind of stop us. Um, I think that's the beauty of having something that's slightly temporary. Um, I really feel like one of the things that we learned most in this um, together and then everyone else that was in the kitchen, people maybe that came to eat with us and friends and family, is that we learned the value of food. Um, and as Rory said, both of us were really lucky to actually come to cooking school here. I think I came 11 years ago. Um, and uh, you really understand the value of food. There's, you, get your, you get your milk from the cows. Um, there's all these beautiful gardens that you pick up your vegetables. And then you kind of go off into the world and you work in these restaurants and you work in these catering places. And I think for me, I, I, I'd unwound that until, I started, until we started Dillis together. Um, and you kind of, that, that connection to nature, the connection to suppliers, um, the connection to kind of the land and the people and everything, it reaffirms that value of food and what, what it means. Um, and for me as well, I understand that that's not always an option. Like, this is a very idealistic view of what is possible. We had this, like, really amazing boat shed right in the most amazing part of Ireland. Um, we only opened for a few nights of the week. We had loads of crack and everything. So it's not necessarily a sustainable, a sustainable idea for the rest of your life. But what it does, if you, if you do have a dream and you do follow it, even if it is for a short amount of time, is... It, it, it shows you that, so you learn from it. And I think that's what we did, is we learned so much about what can be done, but also about that value of food. And that going forward, no matter what other projects you decide to do, you kind of have this basis of what can be possible, and you don't have to do everything from it, but you can take little parts of it and roll with that, which is really great. Um, in regards to the food, I think the food really felt like it kind of came from Connemara. Um, Loads of the recipes were inspired by maybe being younger in Connemara and kind of rock pools and cooking mussels and all of this kind of stuff and picking blackberries. Um, two dishes in particular that really spring to mind for me, uh, um, we had a carrageen pudding. I don't know if we've got that yet. I don't think so. Um, we had a carrageen pudding, which was... Um, carrageen is an Irish... Well, it's not an Irish seaweed. It's a seaweed, but it's used a lot in Ireland. Um, you learn how to make carrageen pudding here in Ballymaloo, one of the first things you do in the school. Um, but um, a lot of people that would work with carrageen, they would generally just do a kind of milk carrageen that's very flash. And um, we decided to kind of take this idea and kind of make it, make it jazzy, and we mixed it with loads of fennel fronds and seeds and unripe salted gooseberries and made this kind of wacky version of what we wanted a carrageen pudding to be. Um, and it was really exciting and great, especially to give it to maybe the kind of older audience that came to Dillis to who kind of vowed never to eat carrageen pudding again, and we made them taste ours, and we kind of converted them back, which was really great. Um, another dish that really springs to mind for us is, it's going to come later, but it's, it's just some deep-fried shrimp. Um, it's shrimp. We had a dish similar in a restaurant in Paris called Chateau Briand. Um, but what was really great about the shrimp in the same way about the seaweed is that when you're, when you're fishing for shrimp or when you're trying to get seaweed, you're totally dependent on the tides. Um, and in, in nowadays in the world, we kind of, we get whatever we want. We just go into the supermarket and we can, we can pick up whatever vegetables or whatever things, no matter where in the world they come from. And when you're working that closely with nature, when it's rock pools and the tides, you have to get them when they're at the lowest or when you're picking seaweeds, you're actually totally dependent on nature. And there's this really nice thing where if you get it wrong, there's no going back. There's no like getting something else. And, and I really like that. And with the, with the fishing for shrimp, um, on like some of the last nights that we did it this year, the tide times were so close to when we were serving dinner that 
as a whole, you know, all kind of eight of us that were working on the project, we'd be down shrimping literally about 15 minutes before the guests came. So much so that when all the guests did come, everyone had these like wet pants and like someone had nets and someone still had like a shrimp in their like in their in their in their in their shirt. Um, and I really I really love that. Luckily we yeah these pictures that are up here. Luckily at that time we had Shantanu who um, I'm sure you can see is an amazing photographer and he was there to capture all of that for us, which is really and, great. And that's that's kind of about all I can claim to contributing in this uh, endeavour uh, because. I've, I've had a very uh, uh, fortunate uh, experience to be with these guys, and I, I kind of feel like I was acting as a bit of a therapist um, to this project, and not in the sense that I'm going to offer any advice to what they should do, but that I was able to have an insight into both sides of the story. Um, both sides being that the first would be the side that these two have. Um, Katie and Jasper have, I, I met them uh, quite a few years ago now when I first came to Ireland. Um, actually, my first Irish experience was to go to one of Katie's um, dinners. I literally flew in and went straight to her dinner, so that set up my complete love for this country within an instant. Um, so, but what I got to do was I got to see their side and what they were so passionate about and what they were trying to achieve um, and you often, when you go to any of, of, of these Dillisk dinners, which was the last two years they were on, um, the, the guests get to see one side, which is the experience, which is the food and, and everything that comes with that. And all you want as a guest is to have more and more and more and more. Um, but what, what was nice about Dillisk is that it's become an impermanent project, that it is something that uh, is more of a pop-up. And, and I think it's a really great representation of a pop-up because for me, when something is there impermanently, which I, I say is a pop-up, but it kind of sounds like a candy, so I'm gonna go with impermanence. Um, what's, what's nice about that is that it shows what, what the artists, what the chefs, whoever is creating it, where they're at at that point in time. And you, can, you get a bit of an insight into, into what they've learned so far and where they're at in their, in, in their careers or in their life in general, in their creative endeavors. Um, and so what's, what's really nice about that is I get to see that side with them and how, why they're passionate about what they do. And then I get to flip over and also be someone who is a guest and, and have that experience as well. And um, I think I was one of the only people that got to actually have Dillisk dinners three times in a row um, because I kind of just hovered around and pretended that I need to take more photographs or something. Um, and Katie said, do you want to sit down again? There's a spare seat at the back. I went, oh, okay, yes, of course, if, you know, if, there's, if there's room. Uh, so what was really kind of special in, in all of this was that um, when, you, when you sit down at the end of it and you get to go through all of these photographs of different moments and you appreciate what was, and, and what skills these two have brought to the table so far. And then you kind of get a little bit sad when you hear that, that Dillisk may not be happening this year, or it might be happening in a few years' time, or it might not happen again. You get a little bit sad for a moment, but then you kind of appreciate that there's going to be a different project, that this passion and this drive and everything that they've learned will kind of get transferred over to different uh, projects in the future and that we don't have to be quite sad and, and hold on to this idea that everything is, is permanent. And that's why we kind of uh, labelled this presentation in a way that it was that it was subtle impermanence because there's an elegance behind everything that the two of these do, uh, the two of these do together, uh, and and that it's that it is impermanent, uh, and and to bring that out of the shadows and and, and right up front. Yeah. Do you think there's uh, anything else? Have we have we kind of given them a wrap? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So we we'll be here in I think there's going to be a short video and then there'll be a Q and A. So if yeah. there's any questions, any questions, anything that's itching your mind, we'll, we'll be around. Talk about Thank anything. You. <laughs> Thank you.